Welcome back, listeners and even viewers to the Arcade Attack podcast. We've got another amazing guest on today's show. We've got a true ocean legend. He's also worked at Sega as well, I believe, and he's worked you know, all around the world, Mike Lamb. So thank you so much for your time today, sir. Well, thank you for the interest, uh, Adrian. It's been uh, really good uh, listening to a couple of your other podcasts, and uh, I'm very happy to do this. Well, that's that's how we first kind of connected because um, I posted uh, my interview with with Ed Rotberg, uh, the the creator of Battle Zone. You kindly said, you know, you retweeted and you kindly commented how good the interview was. I'm not trying to give myself a pat on the back, but from an industry legend like yourself, that meant a lot to me. So, before we get talking about your career, would you be happy to talk about? Um, yeah, you obviously love Battle Zone, so we'd be happy to sort of discuss that a little bit, Mike. Yeah, I was I was always fascinated about how they did that in, in the eight bit era. Looking went back when we were working on sort of eight bit microprocessors and and yeah, certainly when the sixteen bit computers came in, you could see how that sort of thing was possible, you know, sort of doing battle zone was possible. But looking back at it when you're working on eight bit, you were just trying to figure out how how the hell did they get something like that to work, you know, in, in uh, that day and age. So yeah, it was a it's a fantastic accomplishment, Battle Zone. Technically, I'm sure a lot of people admired it, and uh, you know, so inspired a lot of people. Oh, thank you. No, I really appreciate. It. Ed was a, a, a real a real gentleman to talk to, a real honour. And um, no, I'm yeah, really. Terry is a nice guy too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did quite humble, didn't he? Actually. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm honestly, Mike. I can't wait to talk to you as well today because some of the, some of the games you've worked on, I, I played as a kid. Um, I've got huge memories of actually. There's a couple I haven't played, but I've done a bit of digging around and some interesting stories. Oh, like for sure, yeah. Um, before we talk about sort of specific games, are you happy to sort of talk about how you first got in the industry? What because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like kind of spectrum days, and we sort of doing things in your bedroom. I'd love to hear kind of how you got your sort of. Yeah, your big break, really. Well, I was very lucky because uh, there was a kid in the year below me at school. He actually wrote, uh, uh, I don't know if you sort of played these games, he wrote them for Arctic. He wrote uh, Invaders and Galaxians uh, oh. and Robert Ray. So, sorry, I knew Robert, Robert William Ray was the guy who wrote them. Uh, it's Robert's, it was his brother who I knew. But anyway, I knew, knew of this kid and he, he'd written these games for Arctic and they came out at Christmas time, you know, right after the Spectrum came out. And he, he, he did very well out of them. He made tens of thousands of pounds out of them, which, you know, was quite a lot of money back then, you know, sort of because we're talking a while ago. And um, yeah, so that's what kind of inspired me because I was always, you know, playing on the computer at the at the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, school office and everything. And we didn't really have proper setups with all the, you know, so we just had one computer we had to share, and it's four or five of us or something. But yeah, I was always interested in computers. That's what kind of gave me the spur to sort of like get out and buy a Spectrum and uh, and get programming myself. Good on you. And actually, the, the ZX Spectrum Plus was the first computer I ever had as a kid and soon moved right. on to the Amiga. But I have brilliant memories of the Spectrum. Um, right. Uh, what was the first game you worked on uh, for the Spectrum? Do you remember? Well, the first thing I did was um, I, we had, I think it coincided with my first year at college, right? My first term there, I think, that they had a different arcade game came in into the college bar every sort of like, uh, you know, every term or something. And the first game they had was Pool. You remember the pool game with the six balls or whatever, and you just had to shoot them and aim the, you know. <laughs> and it was basically just a rip off of that game or, or or an adaptation or whatever. And I wrote that on the spectrum, and it, you know, it did. Um, I sent it round to a few people and see see if anybody was interested in publishing it. And yeah, brilliant. And actually, I think that moved on to Steve Davis Snooker. Is that right? That that's that... right. Well, we we that did sell fairly well for them, and they did a uh, did quite well out of it. And the publisher were quite happy with it, so they wanted to do a, a follow up. And it was quite far sighted on in uh, in ter- you know in terms of the industry, in terms of where it was back then. They realised that having a license on it might help it sell a lot better. So uh, they signed up Steve Davis. Yeah, that's great. And obviously, you know, you're right. This was early days in the computer game industry getting a big name kind of celebrity a big he was massive back then was let's, let's be honest right. was uh was was pretty cool was um i mean i've got to ask paul like, i assume was quite simple the rules of paul were quite simple but snooker um yeah but a bit more difficult to program was it was it a challenge to get the kind of the rules and the difficult is it was there a big challenge really compared to paul and snooker um the, the bigger challenge was having more balls on the table at the mm. same time and that was you know you got so like a or 10 or 15 reds right whereas the pool gamer did only had six balls at once you know mm. so we had to shrink the balls down a bit and everything had to run a bit tighter because you know you had to run, run a bit faster i guess um but yeah that was a major problem the actual rules themselves are you know they weren't i mean it's still like red ball color ball That's red ball you know. color it's not that you know it's <laughs> just uh, tough for bit... me then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Was um, I've got to ask actually, did you ever get a chance to meet Steve Davis? In person? Yeah, sure. When we uh, when we launched the game, I think we met uh, him and uh, Barry Hearn. Uh, oh, nice. So yeah, they were sort of they came down. I think it was a big uh, Earl's Court computer show or something like that. Yeah, I think we went down for that and uh, we met him all there. Was he a nice person to chat to? He, he was quite good because he was quite interested in computer games himself at the time. I mean, I think at the time, it, it, whenever he was uh, staying at a, at a hotel for a, a tournament or whatever, he, he always insisted on having a Space Invaders or Galaxy or some, some sort of arcade machine there. Oh, nice. So he's quite genuinely interested in sort of like what we were doing and sort of like that. So, yeah, it was a bit more than the usual, you know, sort of like slap your name on, 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 a, on a cartridge and, you know, you know, collect a million quid or whatever they, they, they usually do, but... But yeah, he was quite good. Yeah, good stuff. And he's got—he's been dubbed being a bit boring. Actually, it's a bit harsh, really, because I think he's quite an interesting person. We get to you see interviews, but, right. but I don't suppose he came across boring to you, did he? I, you know, was it quite an honour to meet him? I suppose, or no? I mean, he was—I think he was just getting a lot of attention, and he was fairly normal, you know. Yeah. So, like, so yeah. I mean, he, you know, everyone expects him to be outlandish, or you know, to—I to, don't know, sort of like. Uh, to be snorting cocaine or drinking, you know, sort of gallons <laughs> yeah, of yeah. beer every night or something. No, he was fairly, you know, average and, and had his head screwed on it and, in terms of that. But I wouldn't say it was particularly boring. No, I mean, it was, yeah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I A slightly personal question. I don't, don't have to answer this, but I, I read somewhere on the internet that uh, you, um, that Steve Davis actually made more money from your game than, than you did. Is that fair for that particular game? That- I think that's true. I think I was getting something like 40p a a cassette or something and i think steve davis ended up with a quid and uh they they uh, cds the publishers had to work very hard on me because i I was sort of thinking well why does he get more than i'm getting or something like that i was you know being quite and and um they said well look we're going to sell three times or four times as many so what do you want you want so like you know uh you can either take less of you know, so it's going to work out better for you. And, you know, they, they were absolutely right. I think they told me it's, all, it's going to sell twice as many, but uh, I think it sold about three or four times as many wow. as the pool. So it was, you know, no complaints, I guess. How how old were you back then with this game? Was it, You must have been pretty young then, I think. I was just going to – so I was probably about 17. Wow. I turned 18, I think, when it, uh, it was just coming out, I think, yeah. When you were going around college and stuff, did people know that you, you made video games? Or were you, was it quite like a – big thing or is it you kept it quite quiet I like to know kind of as an 18 year old that I don't think I could have kind of like kept that right. quiet kind of thing I don't know what they do these days um it, it wasn't that unusual I didn't feel like I was an oddball I mean people knew I wrote the Steve Davis snooker I think we had a you know uh uh when I think they had the final that final when the um he, he lost on by missing the black at the last one I think 1981 or right. 82 it was when the uh, the SAS uh were broke into the embassy they stormed the embassy at the same time. Oh, so it was yeah. quite a big... Anyway, I remember I had a whole crowd of people so like in my room. We were all watching it and everybody knew I was with Steve Davis or, uh, back, you know, he was he was on my game. So, yeah, it wasn't like that unusual or anything, no. Oh, bless you. Um, I've got to ask, because obviously you worked in a few games and you had some early success, very young age, uh, but you got the opportunity to work at Ocean Software, huge, huge, you know, iconic company i mean how did that come about are you happy to fill in the kind of gaps between steve davis and getting well to... yeah after steve davis uh, i was working with uh, cds and they they quite reasonably thought well we could move on we could do a golf game with uh sevi balesteros who was a big uh, spanish you know golf player at the time and to be honest i think i kind of like i disappointed them that i wanted to make it all like a, a complete 3d simulation almost of golf and i think what they wanted was something you know fairly simple arcade type feel that, that like you know you can just and uh yeah so it didn't really go so well and they eventually so after about th- three or four months i think that we decided it wasn't going well so um and and i was looking around for work i guess and i was looking at ocean at the time ocean were doing they had a reputation for getting fantastic licenses mm. and i think they'd realized that the games weren't working out so well for them or some of the games have been a bit disappointing in terms of the, the quality of them so they were looking to hire people. And I thought that would be a good fit for me because, you know, I, um, I was quite a good, I thought I was a good programmer and I could do well. But, and I didn't want to sort of like work in obscurity, work, work uh, you know, spend a year working on something and then it didn't come out and didn't get the su- support or success that, you know, I felt it deserved. And I, I felt like if you could do a good job at Ocean, you, you wouldn't really be lacking in success, right? Or it would be, the game would do well because they would promote it, they would market it. They, they, did, all, they did all that great. It was just that the games weren't that good for them at the time yeah did, did you move did you move to work in the offices were you still working from home or no no i moved to work in the offices uh and that was a good thing for me too i think because i was a bit lonely just not working just up, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> on the home, just sort of like, and it, and it was quite, no, it was quite a good feeling, just sort of meeting a lot of programmers, and we did uh, not only sort of like you know socially, which was great as well, but it was also good talking to them, and we you know it was a good cross pollination of ideas going on there. Good stuff, and actually, like you said, Ocean were known for their sort of movie licenses, and I think right. it's fair. I think it's fair to say that some. Not just Ocean. I'm not trying to go Ocean, but some of the movie kind of adaptations of games wasn't brilliant. There wasn't. There were some, um, you know, diamonds in the rough. Let's be honest. But I mean, did you, out of all the licenses you worked on, and I, I like to say, my the games you worked on, I think have been very successful. You know, with, like you know, we'll get to one later. But um, which out of all the licenses you got your, your, your hands on at Ocean, what were you most proud of? What sort of? Um, um I think probably Robocop. You know, Robocop. Yeah worked out well and it was quite satisfying for us as well because i think the big game that's that christmas that they had penciled in was going to be operation wolf that they thought that was going to be the number one and everything and uh and robocop it was a bit of a sleeper as well because uh uh i I don't know they, they they signed up the license they didn't really expect that much from the movie or whatever but um it, it ended up being number one at the Christmas for when we released it. So we were all very pleased that we beat an Operation Wolf. And, you know, I guess the people at Ocean were happy too. So, yes, yeah, and Operation Wolf is a good game, I have to say. I used yeah, to it wasn't, you know, it was fantastic, you know, sort of like just, just fun. But uh, I, I guess, honestly, I think the, the movie ended up being a lot bigger on video than it was on uh, when it came out in the theaters, in the movie theaters at the time. You know, it was. Um, uh, it, it, it came out in, in for Christmas at the same time as the game did. So there's a lot of support yeah. there between the video and, and the, the video game, I guess. I've, I've got a few more questions about Robocop in, in a minute, but I want to try and go, if you don't mind, am I kind of the order? If, if, okay, if fair, sure, um, yeah, yeah. Do, before you, yeah, did you get to meet any famous actors while you're working on, on sort of films, this filming sort of games or anything like that? Or did you visit any uh, film sets or anything? Not particularly. We did get down to uh, to London, to Pinewood, I think, where they were shooting Batman, mm. uh, Batman the movie. But uh, they did it on a day. We, we were just going down for sort of like set reference mainly and to sort of get stills and sort of like, it's mainly for the artists, I think, got the, the most out of it to, compared to the, yeah. So, yeah, we, we did that. But they did it on a day when they weren't shooting. So we didn't oh. meet anybody famous there. So, like, so that was about, you know. Um, so, no, I don't think we met. We, you know, we had one or two people come into to Ocean over the years, I guess. Uh, Keith Chegwin came in and did oh, nice. two or three days there. He was sort of filming. So, yeah, it was a, you know, but it wasn't It wasn't like it. That was a, a rarity. It wasn't like every day a celebrity or whatever. So, Did you get to at least see the films uh, beforehand? Like that sort of... Right, yeah, definitely. Um, we had to go to uh, to New York to watch Batman because they oh, wouldn't... Right. It, it, that was the days when, you know, it came out in America, so like three mm. months before it came out in England. I guess they can't do that these days because it's all, all, all spoilers and everything. But, but yeah, we got flown to New York to go see it, uh, you know, so, so that was a, That's a bit fun. of a perk, yeah. Um, I think I've got Top Gun, uh, one, one of the games you worked on. Um, right. What, what Top Gun port did you work on? What? Because there's a lot of Top Gun games. So I don't want to get it wrong, Mike. Can you happily just fill us in? Yeah, I worked on the Spectrum and the Amstrad versions. And to be honest, they weren't that good. We were trying to do a vector graphics game similar to sort of like um, uh, what Battlezone. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were kind of getting making some sort of progress with it. But um, I think what Ocean didn't realize at the time was that sometimes, you know, when you've got these licenses, you need to, you can't sort of like say, well, we've got three months to do a game or, or four months to do a game. Yeah, I think, I think the, the deal was I was hired in September and they wanted the game for Christmas. So they needed it for, you know, the end of November. And um, I, I guess I had a death in my family at the time as well. Oh, so that, that took that. me out for a couple of weeks. And so the games were, you know, they were pretty disappointed with them or, or, not well, I don't say disappointed. They've been doing a lot of disappointing games, but it was another disappointing license from uh, from Ocean that we, yeah. You know, so it's not one I'm particularly proud of, I guess. Fair enough. Are you a fan of the film though itself, and are you looking forward to the new? Yeah, Tom yeah, film? it's a uh, it's a good laugh. Yeah, you know, it's um, what can you say? I mean, I I thought Tom was good in uh, Risky Business, so he, that yeah. was the film after Risky Business, and we all liked that one. So yeah, I thought it was all right, you know. And it's. Come back. Could you? Would you make a new game for the new movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know that I'm quite in a box office so enough for that, right? So uh, I don't know. Um, after, so I think you worked on Renegade, um, if, if that's right. And that's, that's kind right. of like a Double Dragon s game, isn't it? I think it was actually pr- prior to Double Dragon in the arcades. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, right. What what was your role on Renegade and what ports did you work on? And I, I like to ask. Did what, you... Renegade, I think it was a Taito. Uh, it's a coin op. Taito uh, yeah. made the original, right? 
And um, we, we signed a license, or Ocean signed a license to develop that. So the first Renegade was just pretty much a copy of that. Uh, then I think what they, Taicho went on and did Double Dragons, mm -hmm. right? And we didn't get a license for that. But somehow we, we did have the rights to do a, a Renegade 2. So we put all the two-player stuff in Double Dragons, except we put it into our, you know, the Renegade game, I guess. So, oh, yeah. Nice. No, because I mean, were you, were you a fan? Were you actually when you were sort of working on like a port of an arcade game? I, I assume you played the arcade game yourself quite a lot. Or we, we used to, yeah, you usually get a, a, the board, an arcade uh, board or something like that, and they had a sort of like a special room where we could go and play, sort of like and and you know, sort of like yeah. They ended up having to put a lock on the the individual games so people didn't spend all morning playing them or whatever. But yeah, so <laughs> what. What was the office like, Ocean? Was it was there like lots of games? I, I know there's work to be done. Was it quite a nice atmosphere though? Was it like a? How would you explain yeah, it was it? pretty good because I mean uh, I think as I say, um, Gary. Well, well, I think they realised uh, you know that they needed to hire sort of programmers and do sort of a lot of these jobs in house rather than farming them out of house, and so they hired a lot of people all at the same time. And so it's like you know, there's a whole bunch of us have come together, sort of like uh, you know, sort of twenty twenty one years old or sort of, you know early yeah. teens. Or late teens or whatever. So we're all sort of like, you know, meeting up together in Manchester. So we had a good group, you know, going on there. So it was a good, uh, good crack, yeah. Good, cool, yeah. And uh, I have to say, I'm, I'm Robocop, what a great game that was. And I have to say, what a great film as well, you know. Let, oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, one of my favorite films of all time, and I, the game didn't disappoint. I remember playing it on the Spectrum uh, and the Amiga as well. So, can, can you remind? Sorry, Mike. Can you remind, what versions of Robocop did you work on again? If you don't mind, I worked on the uh, Spectrum and the Amstrad versions. Brilliant. Are they, I mean, great ports. Um, how hard was it? To, I mean, you said earlier you didn't, Ocean weren't expecting that to be a particularly successful title, but can you remember your sort of developing that game? How easy was it to create that? And go, go um, a bit I, th I think what it would have done, they, Ocean signed the rights to sort of like all the video games of, of, uh, for Robocop. So they had everything. There wasn't a division. For, so I think they sub licensed the uh, the game to Data East. So we were able to take a, a bunch of ideas from the arcade game that they developed, right? And also add some stuff in of our own that we've been working on separately. And uh, so, you know, it there was a lot to do in sort of like, I don't know, it was only four or five months or something like that. So there was a lot to do, but it was it was quite good because I think we did, um, we managed to sort of like fit the elements to the fit of the film to the game, you know, so like, and sometimes we're able to do that. Sometimes, I mean, like Top Gun, okay, we, we were having sort of like, it was about, you know, jet fighters fighting each, each other. But beyond that, there wasn't really anything that you could take from the movie, right? Mm, but yeah. with the uh, Robocop, you could almost tell the story with just different elements of the game that, you know, we could put, um, we, we had the, the ID masking little sub game thing in there that just tied it together a little bit. Uh, so, so yeah, it was, it was quite nice that, um, everything that we did as well on that game more or less worked and sometimes they don't work and you just have to leave it in anyway because you know, because it's a license and it had to go out or whatever but uh, I think more or less for sort of like a Robocop everything more or less worked first time so it, it, yeah it was nice the way it worked it's, I, I still play it's, so, it's a hard game but I remember vividly watching my brother complete it was like destroying Ed 209 at the end is <laughs> a tough game though isn't it it was a tough game yeah 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 Good, but um, I like I said, loved, loved it, loved it, loved it. Actually, Robocop. Did you work on any, any follow-up Robocop games at all? Was it just that particular one? No, it was just that one. I think yeah, because I think by then they had Batman or something. So uh, yeah, I was working yeah. on Batman again. Yeah, I was going to ask about Batman. I mean, let's be honest, Robocop, Batman. These are two huge. You know, I know Robocop wasn't huge at the time when it came. You know, early right. days. But it's massive. And how, how were you always a fan of Batman? How did that opportunity come about? I was always a fan of Batman. I mean, I, I remember forcing my grandma to buy me a Batman comic and she was complaining how much money it was. It was five, <laughs> five bob or something like that. It was just five shillings. It was 25 pence or something like that. But I was, oh, I remember reading this comic over and over again because I couldn't afford, she couldn't afford to buy any more for me. She was telling me so, but yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was dead, dead into Batman. Yeah. What, what version of Batman did you work on? Cause again, there's, there's quite a few. It was there? uh Batman, the movie that, that came out for the, uh, you know, for the, you know, um, so yeah, we, we, we came out at the same time as, uh, the movie came out. And you, did you work on the Spectrum one again? Is that right? Or yeah. What? Yeah. I remember sort of like walking into the record store, HMV, and they had literally taken up one whole wall just for the Prince album yeah. that was coming wow. out with Batman, the movie, you know, so that was the, the, the ba uh, Prince's album came out at the same time as Batman. And we just realized then that this thing was going to be just huge. I mean, it was, you know, that, that everything was going to go, people were going to go mental over it. So, 
again. It did well, didn't it? Was that? Can I ask? Yeah. You, at this time, was Batman your biggest seller then? Uh, if your career, I don't know. Good. They didn't really tell us the sales figures at Ocean, so I think it probably was because I mean, I think even if it hadn't been, even if it, you know we just put a, a blank tape out there, we could probably have sold enough <laughs> anyway. anyway. So <laughs> yeah, another another brilliant game, actually. Yeah, um, brilliant, brilliant game. Um, I mean. I've got to ask actually about it's a bit of a sad story, but I'm David Ward's uh, the co-founder of. Uh, oh right, yeah. He, he sad. He sadly passed away quite recently. Um, did you? Did you? Do you have any sort of reflections of working with him, or, or do you have any memories of him, or anything you'd like to say? I really didn't get to meet him personally all that often, you know. So like it was uh, basically we went through Gary. We were working with Gary and Lorraine, and I guess they would have discussions with the people upstairs. I guess so. We didn't really get to meet him personally, but. Um, you know, the company that he put together, I guess, we're all, you know, working for him. And, uh, you know, I think he um, – and I, I think I, I said earlier that the, the, the thing that David realized, you know, before anybody else was how important licenses were going to be. And he managed to sign up all these – get all these licenses for Ocean. And, and that was why Ocean was successful because he had that real, that inspiration or whatever. And, uh, and, you know, he did that before everybody else. Oh, bless you. No, you can – you know, rest in peace, obviously. Um, yeah. Was there, is there any other sort of games you're proud of working at Ocean? I know we, got, we can't talk about all, every game you worked on, say, Mike, obviously, but before we sort of talk about uh, you moving to the US, w- was there any other sort of games you worked on you're very proud of at your time of there? Um, yeah, I guess Wet Le Mans. I worked on Wet Le Mans, which was a racing game. And what I did at the time was uh, we, we went and looked at all the other racing games on the spectrum, came up with a, a track drawing routine. Uh, and I honestly felt I was very, very happy with the track drawing routine that I came up with because, um, you know, it was, it was running twice as fast as you know, anything else. And it had much more detail on it as well. So uh, I was quite pleased that this was going to be, you know, quite a, quite a good game. But then they wanted me to work on Batman, uh, which, you know, so I had to give that up and give that over to somebody else who did a great job of it, by the way, and finished up and great. But it would have been nice to finish that off. I guess that's about the only thing... Uh, no, fair uh, enough. Um, didn't do, but but I, I guess if you've got the choice, you either work on that or Batman. I mean, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, is it? Uh, is that's it? pretty cool. <laughs> but yeah. Batman is pretty cool. Um, can I ask him why did you choose to leave Ocean and actually? I think you moved to the US soon after. Is that right? And right, yeah, right? yeah. Well, Ocean felt like a bit of a dead end in in terms of professionally. Like I've been there about five years, and I didn't really see where I'd be doing anything different if I'd uh, stayed another five years. Which I, well, I don't know, maybe it was, yeah. And plus, I just always wanted to see the States. I always wanted to sort of, like, you know, move, uh, live out there and, and uh, you know, get some sun, I guess, compared to Manchester, right? <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And what, what part of the US did you move to? Did you have a job lined up or do you almost take a risk? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had a job lined up, uh, with a guy called Bob Jacobs working at Malibu Interactive, he called, uh, they would call them themselves, yeah. Ah, good stuff. And how... So, yeah, sorry, carry on, Mike. My, my apologies. It was supposed to be near Malibu, but it was actually about like, you know, half an hour's drive away. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> still not bad then. Um, yeah. But how, how does it, are you still living in the US now then, or are you in the UK? No, I'm, I'm living in Jamaica now. Jamaica, wow. How cool yeah, is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, uh, I met my wife and you know, we sort of like got married and here I am. Oh, bless you. Well, we'll, maybe we'll come to that maybe at the end when we talk about leaving the, the industry, if that's all right. But Oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, how would you compare their work in the UK compared to the US gaming? Were they very similar? Was it different kind of cultures? I like to, how would you sort of summarize the two kind of different worlds? I think it's very different in terms of the way that the company was set up. I mean, at Ocean, you were working for the publisher, right? And, mm-hmm. and when we were working for Malibu Interactive, uh, we weren't publishing games. We were developing for, you know, the, the, the publishers and Bob would, you know, work from that way. But I think the thing that Bob was quite open about was uh, that we never heard about sales figures at Ocean. They didn't want anybody knowing how, who sold. We, we'd hear bits of gossip from the warehouse yeah. or something yeah. like that. But he never, like, you know, got a royalty statement or anything like that. So, um, but no, working for Bob was he, he did actually sort of pay people royalties. So we knew exactly, you know, how much he was getting and, and, and he'd give us a sort of portion of that. So, uh, yeah, it was quite different, I guess. Yeah, and we were working for console manufacturers, I guess, uh, as opposed to sort of like, you know, uh, doing 8-bit games. We were yeah. uh, firmly on console by that stage. I mean, some of Ocean, we'd started doing that as well. But, um, yeah, so, so it was quite different in both those respects. And, and some of those games, I think I've got here, like um, Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing, Riddick by right. Boxing, great, Greatest Heavyweights. I think they're all Mega Drive, Sega Mega Drive games, correct me if I'm wrong. And, uh, um, I think, yeah, the... the uh, 
Riddick Bo, I think, was a Super NES, but it was oh, the same okay, code base, yeah. Um, I mean, you obviously made these. How, how did the contract work with your company that you're working with and Sega? Was it were you working really closely with them? And for example, or? Um, Bob was a, you know was a, running our company. He was about the greatest salesman I've ever met. You know, he was, he was definitely Steve Jobs level type nice. salesman that you could really, you know, you'd warm to the guy and you'd, you'd want to work with him. And yeah, he was very good at that. And so he got a lot of contract, very good contracts. Uh, and then get this. The boxing one was with uh, Sega, and say you know when you're working on on consoles, working for the for the actual uh, developer of the the console is a lot better than just being working for some you know some third party publisher. So you know, Bob got a lot of very good deals, I guess, and and uh, he got a lot of big titles there. And and uh, after that, he more or less left it to just us to you know work with the people at the publishers, and you know that he'd step in if there was a problem, I guess, but. There weren't too many. No, good on you. Not, and back to the, these boxing titles. We, are you a big fan of boxing yourself? And what was it like I, working I wasn't, on? I wasn't when I started, but, um, you know, you get into it, you have to do a bit of research. There is, you know, there's a lot of stories to be told there you know, in boxing and everything like that. So, yeah, you do follow it and you, you do, uh, you know, carry on with it a bit. So, so yeah, I, I, I was, I, I wasn't a fan when I started, but I was when I finished. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, did you get to meet any famous boxers when, when you were working on the, your boxing titles at all? Uh, um, I, I, I missed uh, Evander Holyfield by about like half an hour at the, uh, the, the CES right. one, one year. But <laughs> <laughs> And do you have a favourite? I mean, I think on, on your kind of Moby Games list, you, got, you did work on quite a few titles in that genre. Did, have you got a particular favourite out, out of those? Well, I think Evander Holyfield was the best because, you know, it was my first time in America and everything. It was a good time there. Yeah. First time working on a 16-bit console, you know, the, the Sega Mega Drive. And, yeah, I, th- I think that's probably about my favorite. The others felt like I was, I'd was i been successful at it and, you know, thought they did, okay, let's exploit that, which was, uh, yeah, it's fine. That's a good idea too. But I, I think the one I actually enjoyed most was uh, Evander Holyfield, the first one. Ah, good on you, good on you. And, um Again, moving on, you actually you worked on a few N sixty four titles. I think I've got here what Excite Byte sixty four, which was a you know big, a big title actually. You know, and right. it was, it's, it's fair to say it's a bit of a reimagining of the NES classic. I mean, Excite Byte was it's, it's an amazing game on the NES, NES. I'm sure you agree. But how did that come about? And is it is it true that Nintendo only gave that name uh, Excite Byte sixty four quite late in the development? I'd love to hear the kind of story behind that game. Um, well, yeah, I think it's um, there's a lot of politics between Nintendo of America and Nintendo uh, of Japan, mm. right? So Nintendo of Japan are quite protective of their, you know, their properties, and you know, there's a, they make you jump through a lot of hoops before they'll sort of like you know put a put a uh, Excite Bike license on it. But I've I got to say, most of that work was done by Henry, our, our uh, producer at Henry Sturgey was a producer at Nintendo of America, and he could probably tell you more about what was involved than me. But, you know, I realized it was going on in the background as far as we were concerned that, yeah, we had to get through this and, and take the feedback and everything. So, yeah. And you did you enjoy working on that particular game? I mean, it's... Uh, it's yeah, bit... it was a lot of fun. Yeah, because I mean, what we were trying to do, I mean, my, my goal for it was, I think I've been playing an awful lot of F-Zero, you know, the, do you remember the F-Zero? And, yeah. And, yeah. And I, I really loved the, the physics-based uh, uh, reality of that game. It, 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 it did feel like there was a good physics engine there. And so what we were trying to do with Excite Bike was put a, a physics engine in there as well. It was somewhat realistic and and also sort of type of also worked out being kind of fun to play. So yeah, I enjoyed doing a lot of it. That it was a lot of um, you know um, learning there for me. And yeah, you know, no, 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 thank you, Martin. I appreciate it. Um, I've also got here. You you, you kindly said uh, in, in your message to me that you also worked in uh, Slam and Jam for the 3DO and also uh, Kobe Bryant as well. So. If right. Pass, yeah. Your passport title was there again. I, I don't assume you were a fan of. Oh, again, living in the UK at the time, you know, back in the. Were you a fan of basketball? Was that like a whole new? Well, sort of I moved or? out to the states, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, I was, you know, looking at that, and what we were doing is, um, yeah, it was about Malibu Interactive was kind of coming apart. A lot of people were sort of like going off and doing their own thing. Right. Right. Um, and one of the things that yeah had a big influence on me was that we were actually playing. Uh, soccer, I call it soccer because that's what the Americans call it. We're playing football just on a night, sort of on Wednesday evenings, sort of thing. And we got quite a few people coming to join, join in the game. One of the guys that was uh, uh, joined us, started playing with us, was Jim Simmons, and he'd written uh, John Madden's football for the NFL, 
for wow. EA. And he, that was his job. He was just working on versions of John Madden every year for the Genesis, right? And uh, he made an absolute fortune out of it, as you can imagine. You know, so there, there were huge games, and he, yeah. you know, he wasn't he was getting all the royalty for him rather than so sort of like working for someone and them getting a cut. So he, he'd done very well out of it. He made, you know, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say he was making a million dollars a year off of it. It probably underestimates what he was doing. Wow. <laughs> but so it, it kind of gave me the spirit. I think oh, we were doing okay, right? But um, I was just thinking, well, Chris, we just do a couple of years of that, and I'll, I'll be retired and on a beach. So. Um, <laughs> There's me and a couple of the other guys from from left from uh, Malibu got together and we formed our own company, and we were looking around for contracts and everything. And uh, I, I think I hadn't really appreciated, uh, you know, I'd been working for Bob, who was, as I said, was an excellent salesman, and I hadn't really appreciated everything that he did to sort of get the contracts he did. I thought we'd just sort of like, you know, uh, say, hey, here we are, sort of like, you know, give us a contract and pay us a million dollars a year, and we'll just <laughs> do that for a couple of years, and 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 everyone, everyone will be we'll all be retired, but. No, it took a lot more work than that. We ended up uh, working for, for Crystal Dynamics for the, uh, uh, rather than being a, you know, sort of first line uh, console developer, console, or it is a new console. That, but yeah, it was exciting because we were able to do things in 3D that we wouldn't have been able to do, you know, on, on a 16 bit console. And, um, but they didn't get the, they ended up not getting the NBA license, which was quite a big deal as well. Um, that we missed out on that. But, it was a good calling card because everybody else uh, like in the industry saw the game, I think. I think more people saw, you know, in the industry saw it and it was more influential that way rather than sort of like yeah, a lot of people yeah. buying it. So it, it did quite well for us. It did sort of like put a, um, I don't know, bit a bit of a feather in our cap rather than putting money in our wallet sort of thing, I think. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we, we ended up sort of like, so we ended up uh, hooking up with Bob again. And to cut a long story short, he became our agent. And mm. so he was doing the selling and we were doing the developing. And it, we, he ended up with a deal with uh, Nintendo to do, um, do a basketball game for them. And um, they signed up Kobe Bryant for it. And so, yeah, it steamrolled from there. I mean, it's pretty cool. You tried to get the NBA license. Can you imagine? If you still own that now. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's very, very uh, political, you know, so in terms of how many licenses they were giving and and they weren't really giving it to to Crystal Dynamics because, you know, they weren't really a big publisher at the time or big enough for them. So, yeah, it was sort of like, you know, one one of those things, you know. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I mean, you've you've had some huge success. And again, you just sort of reading a little message you gave me here. I think the, is it the 1080 sequel? Is that a snowboarding game? Is that right? Did you say? Right. Uh, we, we we worked on that. And uh, we worked on the, the Kobe Bryant game. Yeah. Uh, and then they, they actually bought a stake in us. And so we were exclusively working for Nintendo for sort of like two or three years. Wow, well, that's pretty good. Cool. And so we did it. And they when they bought the stake, they gave us two games. They gave us the Kobe Bryant courtside sequel, which we I didn't work on. And they also did Excite Bike, or the game that became Excite Bike anyway. Um, and, uh, so after we finished excite bike, we were talking about what to do next and they had, they wanted a 1080 sequel. Um, and it didn't really work out so well. You know, they, they had, oh, I don't know. I mean, they, they had all sorts of expectations that, that they wanted this to be completely different from 1080 or sort of, uh, 1080 with another dimension sort of thing. Um, and I, I guess for one reason or another, we weren't able to sort to satisfy them and, and, uh, so it didn't really work out well. So that, that one didn't end up getting published. They, they ended up taking it back and doing it in-house. And I think I saw right. it about a couple of years later. And it wasn't like we were looking at it thinking, oh, we should have done that or something like that. Or, you know, it was kind of, I don't know, it's a bit disappointing all around, I guess. I'm sorry. Did, so did you actually have a complete game that wasn't released then? Or was it just... No, it wasn't really right. good. I think it was more like six to nine months or so when right, we were right, working right. on something. It wasn't really, you know, it never became co- finished to that extent now what was it like uh, program on the n64 because I've, I've heard it's, it's quite a challenging console to work on is that fair or do you agree or um i don't know i wasn't really doing the, the actual hardware the you know the hardware type stuff uh, i was doing more the game logic and, and that sort right. of type of thing by then so it wasn't you know that much different to me um but no i think it was quite a, quite a reasonable machine i think it was quite well specced and everything that, that the uh they all made a big deal out of it not having a CD, but I don't think that was really yeah, yeah. A, a problem in terms of, you know, because the cartridges were pretty big by then. And and what you gave up in terms of in not being able to access all, you know, the, the, the half, a, half a gigabyte or whatever, yeah. um, you couldn't do that. But you could access everything that you could access could be accessed in, in microseconds, right, it, or milliseconds. Anyway, you could switch the cartridge around. So it was um, it had its pluses and, and 
minuses, I guess. Fair enough. And do you, Mike, do you do you remember the? Uh, I think this is quite close to the end of your gaming career. What what was the last game you ever worked on? If you don't mind me asking, was it like a well, last... after we uh, fell out with uh, Nintendo, or we they didn't? You know, we, we stopped working with them. We we looked around for another game. We found another game. Um, we were working on Backyard Football um, for for a publisher, and it, it, that actually did fairly well as well. I think it is. It got some good reviews and sold pretty well too. But I was fairly burnt out by then because I was yeah, a bit yeah. down with uh, what, with the way 1082 went. Uh, a bunch of people left the company as well at the same time to go off and do their own thing. So you know, it was uh, it was a hard. You know, two or three years, I think. You know, so I was pretty burnt out by the end of it, and I just wanted to sort of take a break. So, uh, yeah, I left at that point. Are you? How would you reflect on your career in gaming? Because you you were there for a few years. You worked on some huge titles. You had big success, but you, you like you said, you know, I don't want to bring any bad memories, but you did say you're quite burnt out. But overall, if you're looking back, how would you sort of summarize everything you went through? Oh, it was a fantastic time to be, you know, to work in that particular field because uh, you know. We were coming through it, so like you know, so people twenty years old. Nobody, nobody was knew more about making video games than some sort of twenty year olds or yeah. whatever. You know, it was sort of like there was nobody like forty or fifty telling you, oh, don't do that, or so sort of like, or you know, we had to sort of like more or less discover it for ourselves. So it was a fantastic, you know, feeling of uh, unexplored territory to sort to work on, right? And I felt like I only did a little bit of it, you know, it's all licensed sports games. It turned yeah, out yeah, being, yeah. but you know, there was a lot of freedom to do like a lot of stuff there that you know you could. Uh, do that. and I think you know working in uh, in in games as well is it was good for a lot of people. I, I was about the only person I knew that had a degree at one point, you know, because everybody right. else had just sort of picked it up in their bedrooms and just sort of like you know just worked on it by themselves. And so it was a great way for people who were you know fairly interested and had talent. They could just sort of come through, and there were no barriers or whatever. You didn't have to get a degree to do the job, or mm. you know there weren't some sort of like people twenty years older than you who knew exactly what they were doing. And, so yeah, it was a it was a fantastic uh, you know career, I guess in a way. Ah, good on you. And have you got a particular favourite game that you think that's my favourite? I'm really proud of that. You know, whether it was the best seller or not, is there any game you think, yeah, that's probably my best work? Probably Excite Bike, I think. You know, it's probably the, the peak me. And after that, it was all downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like but no, sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, when you found it, can I ask actually, because when you actually found out that, that you were going to get the Excite by license, which, you know, let's be honest, Nintendo are, like you said, quite reluctant sometimes to do that sort of stuff. Was Did that give you a big sort of buzz? Was that like, yeah, this is, because it, would you? I think at the time it might have been, you know, by the time we actually finally got the confirmation, it might have been more of a disappointment, a huge oh, disappointment than really? the other way around. So we were kind of always working towards that, right? And uh, and Henry always was uh, the guy that was handling it. He didn't let us, you know, worry about it too much. But yeah, it was a huge honor. Uh, yeah. So like when when we you know to get that. And the other thing is that like when I started on Excite Bike, I hadn't actually heard of the game because the Super oh, really? Nintendo, yeah. uh, sorry, the Nintendo Entertainment System wasn't all that big in, in, in the America, UK. In the UK. No, right. right. So a lot of people in the, in in America say, "Oh, Excite Bike, Excite Bike," and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, Excite Bike," but I, I wasn't. Yeah, I hadn't grown up playing it <laughs> as a kid, so. It was a little bit different for me that way, but yeah, it was a a, a fun little game. Yeah. Oh bless you! No, I I have played it actually. I played both versions. They're, they're both stellar actually. They're good, really good fun games, aren't they? Um, yeah. You mentioned the ten ten eighty sequel, but apart from that, is there any other games you worked on that weren't released? Any unreleased games that you think oh uh, got really far with this? But just yeah, I think it was something. Um, yeah, we were working on a hockey game for about six months or so at the end of uh, Slam and Jam. We were trying to work between Sega and. Uh, crystal dynamics that they were quite pleased we were pleased with what we'd done with slam and jam they wanted to do something else the same thing with hockey and i was a big hockey fan or hockey and video games fan because um you know that the ea nhl games were fantastic i thought you know and there was something about hockey that lent lent itself to 16-bit gaming that, that really worked out well so i was quite excited to be working on that but it all fell through and um, we ended up working with nintendo instead which oh, yeah, well. wasn't the worst thing. <laughs> no, it's a shame the game wasn't released, but, you know. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. It, it could have been worse, couldn't it? Um, why did you, Mike, why did you, he sent you a burnt out, but why did you leave the video game industry? I, I like to know. Was it just because you needed a change? And is it true that you became, is it a, a poker player? Is that right? Um, well, there's a couple, couple of things that, that were going on in the video. There's, there's also, I was, I think when, when I started, when we started Left Field, uh, we were thinking we were going to be working on 16-bit games, which went, 
one programmer, one artist, maybe working on it for a year or something like that. And I think what happened gradually, you know, is that because we were working on Slam and Jam, we, you know, it's a 32-bit title, we ended up with two artists and two programmers or whatever. So and I think by the end of, uh, by the time I finished, yeah, they were talking about like teams of about having about, you know, 30, 40 people working on a game for sort oh, of like yeah, two or yeah. three years. And uh, it becomes much more of a management sort type job. And I wasn't terribly good at that, I don't think. And I think uh, part of, you know, why I felt burnt out was I was doing something I wasn't very good at. And it wasn't right. very, you know, so, so yeah, the, 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 the business of making games changed completely from, from being, you know, sort of like eight bit games and even 16 bit games were fairly manageable, but, uh, you know, you end up with, with, uh, uh, teams of, I don't know what, what it is these days. I think it's a hundred plus working on some So you, you got people, you got teams so big that people don't know everybody else on the team, you know, it's kind of uh, a strange situation. So. So, yeah, that was part of it, too. I wasn't particularly good at managing things. So, uh, you know, and I always wanted to sort of like to sort of get my hands dirty sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think you have to stop, you know, sort of like that. But so that was part of it, too. And, uh, was I, was, it, I was a lot better at writing games than I was at actually managing a big group. You know, well, so. I appreciate your honesty. So, uh, yeah, it was it's like, I've got poker. Is that right? Did that take? Yeah, you that's down? right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, and, uh, I was playing poker for a little bit, and uh, this, I don't know if you've, you've ever played poker seriously online, but they have all this sort of software that sort of helps you out. And uh, it was a great story because I, I ended up hooking up with somebody else that I never met before over the internet, and we were working on a, on a, 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 a poker database type program. It would sort of import all the hands and tell you what you were doing, and so you could look at your, your play, you could look at the play of your opponents, and you could you know review the game sort of, sort of thing and see where you were making mistakes. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic thing because I worked with somebody I'd never met in Canada. I didn't even yeah. meet him until a couple of years into that. And, oh, wow. and uh, the, 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 the program was phenomenally successful. I mean, it was more money than I made from a game ever. Oh, know, really? just, just in a couple of years or so. Yeah, we just did that. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it was, it was another, you know, growth. I guess being at the right place at the right time, you know, as much as anything else. So it wasn't a poker video game, was it? It was like a kind of. No, it was sort of like, um, help, yeah. what would you have to do? You'd have to, um, yeah, you, I don't know, when you played poker online, you'd, you'd get the hands exported in a text file sort of thing, and we were importing those hands, and you could, right. you know, review your play going back, and, you know, you would sell, like, a, so, well, I think we sold the, um, Holder Manager was, uh, was uh, our database program. We sold it for, like, 75 bucks. Wow. And I think that the first month, I think we sold something like, you know, sort of like 100 copies. And the next month, it was 200. Then it was 500 the next month. <laughs> and, and now, literally, we, we were doubling every three months, you know, up nice. until we were selling. We were, you know, we are bringing in almost 100,000 a month by the end of the oh, Crazy. Time we sold out. Yeah, it was crazy, you know. It was a, oh, good on you. Uh, that must yeah, be such yeah. a buzz. Yeah, yeah. You, Better than winning a game of poker, but we've just seen it every <laughs> month. <laughs> I, I think we used to have to sort of like uh, log on to sort of like people when people got problems. We used to do a team viewer session where we'd look and see their, you know, their their screen, their, and then we'd try and have them try and show us the problem with the game. That some of the really big players that you you'd talk to kids that were sort of like you know, ten years younger than me, and I was mid, you know mid thirties by this point, right? And they were 10 years younger than me. And you could see their winnings graph, and they had something like $2 million in the first six months of the year or something like that. And it was absolutely wow. crazy. So, <laughs> But I, I never had the stomach for that. I, I, you know, I, whenever I lost $200 or something, I just thought it would be in such a bad mood. <laughs> I didn't want to play again, you know. So, But, uh, yeah, it was a, yeah, they did all right, some of them, yeah. Did you, even for a split second, think I could make a poker game, a video game, with your past experience? Not really. Um, well, I could. I'd have to go back into into uh, games, I guess, to do that. And I probably lost all my games. You know, so it'd take me that much. It'd probably take me half an hour to get to Hello World or something on a, on a on a console or something <laughs> these days. So, yeah, I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah, I think left field. Uh, the people that are left at left field, they went on and did a, um, a World Series of Poker video game. I think, and that did very well for them. I think, you know, so good on us. That's quite a running all around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, small world, huh? Yeah, it's great. Um, are you, do you still play video games today? Is that a, you, as a hobby or not really? Yeah, but they're more like they're not the Twitch games. They're more the uh, single turn sort of thing, like like Civ, Civ Three. I spent a ton of time on Civ Three. Oh, All right, oh, is that, sorry. Can we edit that a bit out? I'll I'll come look for you in a minute. Yeah. yeah no, All right, give us ten minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry oh, about gonna... that. 
That's right, Mike. I was going to ask actually, Mike, what what would you say are your top three video games of all time? Not not particularly ones you've worked on, but as, as just a fan of gaming, uh, Pac Man. I definitely played that a ton. Yeah. Um, I, I probably should be, you know, be a bit ungenerous of me not to say the pool game that sort of uh, inspired me. That was quite <laughs> yeah, a good yeah. one. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to give them a shout out. Um, and uh, yeah, Battle Zones. I mean, why not Battle Zone? It was a fantastic technical achievement at the time. And, you know, I was a huge fan. I, I spent, that's probably the game I spent most on, you know, so. so oh. Yeah, so uh, most yeah, most ten yeah. Ps at the time, I think they were. Yeah, <laughs> and you mentioned Civ <laughs> Three as well. Obviously, I'm sure you'd be. Oh, well, Civ Three. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's a different type of game, but yeah, I'm, I'm playing yeah. a more slow, you know, sort of like gives you time to think games than the Twitch stuff, you know. So, <laughs> oh, what a legend! Look, Mike, I, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real honour. And um, uh, can I ask you, how did you end up in Jamaica then? Because you've had a quite a you know, I, love I met my wife here when I was on, on holiday, and so oh. I ended up moving here and getting married. And uh, so I've been here ever since, so past what 12, 13 wow. years now. Oh, yeah, right. Do, do, so. do, you miss, do you miss the UK at all or not really? <laughs> <laughs> Depends how sunny it is. Yeah, probably yeah. right now, I probably do, right? But like in the middle of winter, no, not really. You know, it's a uh, bless you. Yeah, no, good. Yeah. Well, no, fair play. You've had a great career, and you know you I, I, you live in life, aren't you? Let's be honest. You're having a great time. I, I take it in Jamaica. So, oh, for sure, yeah. yeah. No, bless you. Um, we ask all our guests one final question. So, again, thank you for your time, saying I'm really honoured. Um, a bit of a crazy question, but if you could share a few drinks with any video game character, who would you choose and why? I was thinking about this. I don't know if it's a cheat at all, but probably Robocop. You know, oh, yeah. because I don't know about if it's Robocop himself, right? But the the, the actor that played him. He had a, an interesting like. He went away. He left film acting and, and completely all the celebrity stuff. And he did an art history uh, PhD. You know, so he really studied. He's got to quite a high level where he's quite respected. Peter, at that. I, was it, it Peter it, Weller? I think it's Peter yeah, Weller. Yeah. Is, I, just check. It is I would Peter love Weller, to hear it? the story behind him. I mean, just thought everybody you know wants to be a movie actor, or so many people want to be movie. He, he gave that up, right, and did yeah, something yeah. complete, and and was fairly successful at it as well. So that would be an interesting guy to sort of like you know pick his brain and see what's going on there. You know. But uh, yeah, oh, that's a great answer. And actually, just 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 thinking back to how good Robocop is. Robocop's not a well, stupid. Robocop, 80s, I think yeah. it, it was underrated. His acting in in Robocop. And I, I've seen it a dozen times, so uh, I'm kind of somewhat of an expert on Robocop. But <laughs> he, I think he's extremely well acted on his part. Yeah, but he yeah. does become he becomes more human as he goes to the. You know, he starts off as being Robocop and being very robotic, and and, and it's something that's sort of, kind of subtle that most people probably wouldn't notice because you only see the film once or something. But I've seen it, you know, maybe a couple of dozen times by now, it's and great. you do notice he does become more human as he goes. And it's very well done. It's very subtle. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think it was well acted. He, he did a, uh, an yeah. awesome job in that, you know. So, yeah, I'd like Just, to see that. It's not on my list of questions, but when you watch things like Robocop or Batman, do you, do you think it back in mind? I worked on this game, or is it just completely? You just, doesn't even cross your it mind. It got to the stage at one point where I couldn't watch a movie without thinking, "How about <laughs> we're going to make a game of it?" And we we got a bit formulistic. At, at, at we got a formula almost for it at Ocean that you know we we'd, we'd, we'd work out. You know, uh, or, uh, warehouses were very, very good because there's lots of things going on. So it got to a stage where I think virtually every Ocean movie license had a warehouse section where we, you know, we did that sort of thing. So, so it was kind of uh, you know interesting in a way that yeah, we did sort of like start looking at, at you know how how we'd make a game out of a movie that we didn't even have the license for. You know, so wow, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I know we keep chatting. I'm sorry, Mike, but I'm just thinking no, back. No. You know, Ocean again, had some real big success with their films, but do you think in a weird way, like you kind of hinted there, was it a bit too more formulaic? Do you reckon they almost played it, not played it safe? I don't want to have a go at the company, but... Yeah, I guess, you know, that, that's that's fair. I mean, sometimes you get lucky and you get like a license that would, would work fairly well, mm. you know, like say Robocop with with a video game. And then there are other times when, you know, you'd, you'd have to stretch it a bit, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, it was getting to the stage where, you know, you, with 16-bit games, you can almost do a sort of like a, a – you could tell a bit more of a story than you could do with an 8-bit game. And so, you know, you got success of uh, – started getting success of, um, you know, original content on yeah, there. So, of course, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think it changed a bit, you know, as, as, you, as, as, as games got more sophisticated, you could start doing things on games that you couldn't really do in movies rather than the other way around, right? So – Correct, I mean, yeah. look at say Elden Ring. I mean, that that to me is probably like it's got more content in there than than any movie that's ever been done. 
Um, and and so it's almost they and yeah, they they tell a story that you can you know bind in with with the character. So yeah, I think that that has definitely changed a bit. That, that, you know, games have become an art form in their own right, and they don't need licenses so much just to prop them up. But at the do time, you, yeah. yeah, that was yeah. Do, do you still play like modern games today? Then do you, do you play like Elden Ring, for example? Are you into those sort of things? No, no. I just watch my kid play Fortnite a lot. I guess you know. So yeah, yeah. probably I mean, it's more of a second-hand thing, you know, in terms of the, the Twitch games now. I, I, sh- I, I don't have a good enough PC as well to play most of the games either. I mean, he's got one, you know. I, I have to borrow his computer to sort to actually play most of them. So. Good on you. Look, Mike, yeah. I've had a, it's been such a fun chat, and honestly, I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, well, it's great, yeah. Reminiscing it's, it's about your career. talking to someone who's interested in it anyway. Yeah, so. no, really. And uh, look, look you've, you've worked some huge games, some big titles, and um, just some great stories as well, and I really appreciate your time. Really mean well, that. Well, it's been great talking to you, and thank you for the interest, Adrian. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it. You can tweet us at Arcade Attack UK. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arcade Attack UK. Check out our website at arcadeattack.co.uk for lots more retro gaming goodness and to delve into our archives. Our podcasts are also available on Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, YouTube and Apple Podcasts. Please leave us a review and a rating, we'd really appreciate it. If you'd like to support Arcade Attack, please check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash arcadeattack, which will give you access to exclusive podcasts, interviews and other bonus content. So... Until next time, take care and we'll speak to you soon.